So today we will we are going to start talking about the introduction to this course on digital hardware design. So what we are going to cover in today's lecture is first we will talk about what are digital systems. We will talk about some of the applications of digital systems and then we will talk about the design steps involved in designing this. The intent of this course is essentially to discuss how digital systems are designed and how do we take a problem from its very definition to its implementation. So in designing any system, the most important thing is the representation. How do we represent the various components? How do we represent the input and so on? So a characteristic of digital systems is that primarily you handle discrete time. Okay, we will see that this is something which is very different from the way the analog systems handle information as well as they handle the computation. So discrete time, so the signal is dis discretized in two ways. It is discretized in terms of the time. You are not handling continuous data. You are handling data which is sampled, data which is available at certain time events. Later in the course, we will also be classifying the systems into various types. One of the very important classes of systems which are going to deal with it in this course is what are called synchronous systems. A property of synchronous systems is that there is a clock and all the events or at least most of the events are triggered by this clock. The changes that takes place in the system are all synchronized to this clock. And that's the reason such systems are called synchronous systems because there is one single signal, which is a clock signal, which synchronizes this. The other type of uh, discretization or quantization that takes place is relates to the data. When I'm talking of data, I'm referring to not just the data that we are going to compute, but even all types of information that is represented within the digital systems they are all quantized. So one of the important ways that this is done is using the binary numbers. So all, you are all familiar with binary numbers, the information, the data, the characters, everything is represented with binary coding and you have this representation in terms of binary numbers. So a characteristic, a major characteristic of digital systems is that they deal with only discretized or quantized data. An important thing is, before digital systems became you know, popular in terms of applications, for implementation of applications, analog systems have been existing for a very long time. <coughs> it's older, but there are very distinct advantages. The world is actually today going more and more digital, and one would like to know the reasons why people are preferring to design or implement systems using digital implementation over analog. A very important property of digital systems or let's say flexibility the system provides is in terms of programmability. You can program the systems, you can modify the systems, you can program it to perform different applications or implement different applications in different time and all that is possible rather easily. So primarily the software that we hear of, okay, the software that is part of the system. Typically one talks of software only in terms of user programming, but there also as we go ahead with this course, you will also understand that the programming is at various levels in the system. It's not just at the level of the user. It's not at the level that, okay, you can sit on your PC and open different applications at different times. Sometime you may be Netscaping, sometime you may be doing word processing, all of that on the same hardware. But there are also other levels of programming which is actually which you do not see unless you get into the design of the system. And that's also a very important, like for example today the type of revolution you are seeing in microprocessors, you are seeing various types of, you know, various developments, improvements, almost every year, two years you have a different processor coming with more features. All these changes are possible because of the inherent programmability that is possible in digital systems. 
The second thing is predictable accuracy. Predictable accuracy comes from the fact that you are representing the data in terms of some binary representation and you are actually deciding that, okay, I will represent my integers in 16 bits or I will represent my integers using 32 bits. So you are very clear that what is the range of a system. Similarly, when we talk of representation of floating point numbers, again, you have now some number of bits that are used for representing the mantissa, some number of bits used for representing the exponent. And both these define what is the resolution you can have on the numbers. They also define what is the range that you can have on the numbers. And these are very important because what it tells you is, you tells you very clearly what is the range of numbers that you can, what is the accuracy that you can expect from the system. In many of the analog systems, this is not possible. The accuracy depends on many other factors and when we talk about maintainability, we will also talk, we will also sort of this also somewhat interrelated. What happens in terms of analog systems is basically lot of computation as well as things like delays, like here you are talking of discrete time, the clock being the synchronizing event, there the delays are also, they are all depends upon the component properties, that is the resistance value, the capacitance value, the inductance value and so on. And the implication of that is that if these values change, your performance, your even your results will change with change of these values and these values are extremely sensitive to things like temperature. They also require constant tuning and maintainability of the systems. So this analog computers and analog, you know, many of the applications that today we talk in terms of digital, they have been always been present with analog and those have these type of problems. So that is the reason that these are the three primary reasons that the world is switching over to digital from analog. The analog systems, it's not that they are still dead, they are still very much alive and at very high frequency, still there are problems in building digital systems and people sometimes use analog solutions. And also, one more thing, analog will survive basically because the interface of the machines with the outside world continues to be analog. When a human being speaks, the speech that you are hearing is primarily analog. So you have to discretize it, you have to quantize it, you have to convert it into digital before you can process into by the machine. So all the natural phenomena in the world is analog. So they are not, if you measure temperature, the temperature actually changes continuously. It does not change in terms of steps. Okay, if you are making a process control equipment, the equipment may be digital, but its interface, the transducers, would have to at some stage convert the analog signal that is available in the external world to digital. So it's important to realize that the analog systems will always, analog interfaces will always remain. The what is happening is the core of the systems are getting more and more digital. The processing is getting more and more digital. So before we talk about a little bit more about applications, let me talk about the classification of such applications. I try to classify here applications in terms of something which is related to what is the objective when I want to design a system for a certain application, what is the objective I am trying to meet. So I try to classify these applications into three categories, real time computing, interactive computing, offline computing. First of all, I would like to clarify that when I talk of computing, I am talking in the broader sense of the word. Computing typically associate with number crunching. Many of us, when you say, but today, as, as all of you know, that people do not associate computers with number crunching. Calculators may be associated with still making calculations, but when you talk of computers, increasingly you can see that very little of computing has anything to do with number crunching. People are using it for all types of you know, database operations, all types of, you know, for example, all the web all the music that you hear on the computers, all the video clips that you see. So it's becoming more and more, the applications are going more. Of course, 
You may not see it. There are a lot of number crunching going on behind these applications. That's a different aspect. But as far as the user is concerned, his primary intention is not to calculate something. Okay. So here also, when I talk of computing, I'm talking of the broader sense of this word. So basically, all applications which require you to deal with such systems. So there is something called real-time computing. Okay, as the name suggests, we are talking of certain set of operations, some algorithms, some set of algorithms, some tasks to be performed, where you have a certain constraint in terms of deadlines to be met. You have a certain constraint that I have this algorithm, but I should be able to implement this algorithm within, say, 20 milliseconds. Why is this time important? It's because of the nature of the application. Because Typically, the data is streamed in such applications. What it means is that you are not just handling one set of data, but you are handling a stream of data. And if you are not able to process the previous set of data, the next set of data will arrive and you have to process that. So you would have lost processing of some data if you are not able to do it in the time that is available to you. And such applications, so when you are designing systems for such applications, you have to be handle what are called hard real-time constraints. The constraints are very hard. You have a certain task in hand and you need to perform this task within a certain period of time. So that's one type of applications. The next is the interactive computing. You sit in front of a machine and you are processing some, doing some computing. Here, the, you know, so this is also a calculator type of a situation. You want to, let's say, calculate square root of a number. You punch in the number and you are expect that the result should come. Result should come in a reasonable period of time. And you don't care within that. So the constraints are not very hard. They are a little soft. Say a human being is not going to recognize anything which happens, let's say, below 100 milliseconds. Really doesn't matter whether it happens in 10 milliseconds or 20 milliseconds or... So as long as you feel that it is instantaneous, after all, any other next set of computation that you can do with the calculator, you are going to enter the numbers and there is a certain speed that you can enter the numbers. The constraints are not very hard. It's not that you have to finish within, a, critically there is a period of time within which you have to finish. So you have to finish within a time and that time the constraint itself is rather soft. So you can see that when I'm designing a system of the first kind and the system of the second type, the type of objectives I'm trying to meet will differ. Okay, because my system, so you know, so these things are all become very important from the point of view of system design. Then of course the third thing is offline computing, where one is even less interested in terms of time constraint. One would like, of course, that if the computation, so you know. So it takes reasonable period of time, but what is that reasonable can be? The range that is reasonable could vary very much, okay, because it's not something which is to respond. It's not that there is somebody sitting and deciding that, okay, when I will do next thing when this is finished, because it's anyway offline, okay. So this is from one aspect. So this particular classification is not the only classification. We will, as we go ahead and we talk of systems, we will classify in various ways, but this definitely one type way of looking at systems and purely from the point of view of what objective you will design the system for. <laughs> now let's look at the range of applications of digital systems. I'll spend some time over here talking about the applications. Consumer electronics. This is one of the, let's say, the consumer electronics, though, is one of the very old applications, and also it's sort of an application which has a very large market, so it's a, there's a lot of visibility to this application. But because of the issues of cost as well as the technology that is involved in it, what had happened is this is the latest in terms of digital implementations. By and large, most of the radios, television sets, all these things which are sort of part of very widespread use, they are all, were all analog in nature. Their implementation was completely analog circuitry. Then, of course, only 
one part of it, which is the user interface, became digital. Once you started having this remote control and all types of facilities of, you know, handling channels and making changes, so then people went in for some part of it. Let's say if you consider something like a TV, and but it was not the core functionality of the TV. The core functionality remained unchanged. It was still analog. But increasingly today, people have started even changing the core functionality to digital. So the modern TVs that are going to come up, you know, they are going to be more and more digital in nature. So more of the functionality is going to, of course, the reason is the technology, as I said, told you before, so at high speed processing, analog is cheaper, but of course it comes with some problems. So digital is, you know, at certain, there is a certain threshold be, below which the digital actually becomes cheaper, but Okay, so the consumer electronics is one application which is increasingly going to see digital systems. Radar and sonar processing. So it may look like a very special application. Primarily it is, of course it has both civilian as well as military, but the development of it in the 50s and 60s was primarily from the military point of view, especially radar systems. And what happened is this played a very critical role in development of digital systems, especially in some components like multiplication, like implementation of multiplication algorithms, design of multipliers, design of ALUs, high-speed ALUs, they are all tremendously driven by uh, it's the realization of things like radar systems. So they played a very critical part. So later when we talk of some algorithms at least for doing things like multiplication, we may talk about how this development came. Because these are all, these are the first applications which are extremely, let us say, uh, compute intensive. They needed to do a lot of computation and the lot of accuracy and predictability required. So the first systems, of course, radar and sonar systems are all analog in nature, just like in terms of consumer electronics, but because of this need to have a very reliable system, people look for digital solutions. But because they are so compute intensive and to perform all these computations digitally was fairly expensive. But the def defense actually drew the, uh, no, was, it was a drive from the defense applications that they actually made many of these things possible. Control systems is another area of application. It is, we are looking at the control systems also a very wide range of control systems from very simple control systems to very complex industrial controls where you have lots of transducers, lot of. So here the advantages is you can do with digital systems the programmability, you can do lot of sharing, you can you know have lots of channels, you can pick up information from lot of transducers using the same type of equipment because you can have even 128 channels which could all be multiplexed because your computation can be done fast. The amount of computation required may not be very high, but the data that needs to be captured may be coming from different sources. So control systems have this programmability feature, the multiplexing feature where you can share the same resource over time for different applications. All that implies that digital solutions have been a preferred solutions in control systems for quite some time. General computing you are all aware of, general computing today has become more or less synonymous with PCs, but of course, we have all <coughs> other type of systems, more complex workstations, graphic stations, mainframes, you know, smaller systems. They all, of course, are completely dominated by digital systems. A very important class of applications that's now coming in is what's called mobile computing. So to look at mobile computing, so it's also very interesting. So on one hand, you had this communications and then you had computing. For very long time, the development in communication systems was considered completely separately from development in computing systems. Communication had its own, let's say, uh, problems to solve and, you know. But increasingly what had happened is, with especially computing also being driven towards more towards information decimation, information processing, not just pure number crunching. So increasingly people are seeing a merger of computing and communication. And along with this, the mobility that is today provided in communication where the user or the person who is 
using a communication equipment need not really be stationary, it can be mobile, it can be at almost any place. So that essentially implies that there are also some challenges related to computing and communication which get merged. But design of these systems pose an entirely different set of challenges. Like of course, there are some issues which are common, but a very important issue that has come up with design of mobile computing is the issue of power. Till all the other applications we were talking about, primarily people looked at the design of systems from the point of view of performance. See like the previous slide I put in where I talked of hard constraints, soft constraints, or let's say no specific constraints on time. What, it, what does it mean? It means that you are given a certain task and you are given a certain time in which the task is to be performed. So your design of your system is driven by the fact that I have to meet these time constraints, so which is essentially related to performance. If I can break this task down into, let's say, primitive operations, my primitive operations could be addition, multiplication, division. It could also be some other things like shifting and so on and so forth. I can break the task down into my primitive operations. It can all boil down to saying that within this particular period of time, I should have a capability to perform so many multiplications, so many additions, so many shifting, so many, so many memory accesses. All these I can actually break it down into these primitive and I can say that my design should be able to meet these requirements. So this was only in terms of time. Of course, always the cost has been an important thing and typically the cost has been reflected in terms of digital systems when we talk of integrated systems, you know, when we talk of integrated circuits, we are not talking of you know, huge boards and so on. So for typically today many systems are just one IC or two ICs or four ICs. You know. So when you are actually mapping them into, so the cost more or less is becomes synonymous with the area that you require on silicon on the chip for implementing your system. So these were the two major constraints or these are the two major design objectives, minimizing area, meeting a performance or min, you know, minimizing the time where you have a certain constraint on how much can be the cost of the chip or the area of the chip. So these were the primary driving factors behind design of digital systems. But what had now happened is a third dimension has been added to it. So if you look at the, and it's primarily driven from the fact that we are to talking of applications where you have to do battery power or the ba life of the battery is extremely important. Because if you make a system and it's finally, see the type of, let's say, uh, changes or improvements that you have seen in terms of digital systems design in terms of the integration. Later on in the next lecture, I'll talk a little bit about that. So the type of changes you see in terms of the number of transistors that can be packed in a chip, we are not seeing the same type of changes in how much energy you can put into the same area in a battery. There the changes are much. So what is implication is that if you want to consume, if your application consumes a lot of power, a lot of energy, for doing a certain task. So your battery life is going to be very small. And in mobile computing, as well as in mobile communication, so here I am using this word interchangeably. So this is a very major driving factor that how long, if you take a cell phone, it's important that how, how often you have to recharge it, how much time you can talk on it or how much time you can idle with it before you need to recharge it. And it's a very major factor behind whether you can market your cell phone or not. So when you are designing a system like this, it is not just cost in terms of the area of the chip and performance in terms of the time that it requires to perform those computations, but also the energy that it consumes or on an average the power it consumes becomes extremely important. So this has, let's say in terms of the design, there is a new challenge and people are trying to take this factor also into consideration in designing systems. So now let's talk about the steps that are involved in designing systems. Of course, through the course we will be talking about a lot of details of this. 
but I want to give you a very broad picture. So, the process of design, any design starts from specification. You have to specify what is it that one is interested in designing. And in case of digital systems, the final thing that you are interested is in a circuit. Of course, when you talk of VLSI later on as we will talk about the steps in VLSI, there are also issues beyond this. Even if you have got the circuit, you have to actually get the layout and so on. But here we are not really concentrating on that. So, we are talking of specification and eventually a circuit. You know, very loosely speaking, we think of the design process as the process what we have put in here as synthesis. Realization of this specification using a circuit is the process of design. Okay. <coughs> Once I have my specification, I need to do a verification. What does this verification involve? We will see in the next slide. And what do we mean by this verification? Basically, the, even the process of specification many times involves more than one party or definitely it involves more than one person. It typically never happens that the person who wants something, he is designing his own circuit. There is a person who wants that, okay, I want this digital system to implement this, this particular application. He goes and ex comes and talks to you you know, knowing that you can design a system for him, he is going, going to come and explain to you what the system does. But later on, as you will see that once you, he explains to you, it may not be, what you have understood may not be the same as what he wanted. And that is a very big challenge in the design community. Okay, the specification of the system, we will see that they are very formal ways of specifying, but then they have become difficult. So, but you have to verify that, okay, what was, what you are going to design is what was intended to be designed. That is the first part. And then you of course, incise it, you follow some procedures, we will see after all in this course, you are going to talk about procedures for doing this. You realize it and then finally, you get a circuit. And once you get a circuit, you again have to verify that the circuit that you have got was what was required. It actually performs the functions that it was expected to perform. So, this is again the process of verification where you are actually checking whether the circuit performs the specification then. So, uh, the primary intent of this course is to deal with all of these. We will talk about the specifications, we will talk about the synthesis steps and we will also talk about the verification procedures. Let us talk about what is involved in specification. You can do specification using English or any natural language for example. It is very convenient, people already know it. It is not that you have to learn something to design systems, you already know so you can write down what you actually want the system to do. Unfortunately, there are two problems with it. One is ambiguity. It is not very precise, it is not, it is sometimes may be very difficult to exactly explain what you actually want. And sometimes it may be possible to even explain what you want, but it may not be possible to explain what you do not want because that is very difficult. Like under certain situations you want, you are designing a system where given a certain input you should produce some outputs. But if inputs do not follow that sequence, what should be the outputs may not be very precisely defined. You may say that, okay, if I receive these inputs, I should have this output. But what happens if I receive some other input? And describing such things in a language like any natural language is very difficult. So, there is this ambiguity. And of course, the other problem is that it is not suitable for processing by machines, prob related to the fact that it is ambiguous and it is not very precise. So, in this course also, we will introduce a hardware description language. We will also motivate when we talk of this language. So, why can't we use you already know languages like C, Pascal, maybe Java. So, so there are cert certain things about these languages, the typical programming languages which you use 
for writing software. There are certain limitations of which, which makes it that they are not really suitable for describing hardware. We will talk about this in detail. But we will, so the advantage with these languages is that once you write this description of your specification of your design using these languages, you are much more precise. You exactly know that if certain inputs are come, so you can look at those descriptions and you will also know that if you do not get the inputs that you actually were expecting to, to generate an output, what happens? That will also be specified that how the machine will behave if some other inputs are received. Adv another advantage is that these descriptions are simulatable what, by a machine. What it means is I can actually apply the inputs and see the results. That is the process of simulation. I do not even have a circuit. I not even designed the circuit, but I can see that how the circuit will be behaving under all possible conditions. That is what you can do in terms of simulation even without designing the circuit. So, there are what are called simulators available for such languages. They sometimes they could also be executed. But the disadvantage is they are difficult to write and somebody has to learn them specifically to do the design. Okay. So, we will definitely learn one such language. So, lastly, I will talk about, so that was the process of specification. I will talk about what are the things involved in synthesis. Synthesis methodologies. Synthesis refers to the transformation of specification to realization. This is what I tried to describe and this is most of this course will be dealing with this aspect of system design. Specification. Specification typically is in terms of a behavior of the functionality, expected functionality or expected behavior of the circuit. And realization is in terms of the circuit components. There is a, what are the components, how they are interconnected and that is related to the realization. So, one is a behavior and one is a structure. Behavior encapsulates the functionality, structure encapsulates the circuit components and their interconnections. So, when you talk of this realization, the synthesis procedure, there are two methods. One is manual, very, very widespread. And even within manual, I will classify this manual approaches into two. Of course, sometimes there could be a mixture of the two, but one is what is an ad hoc technique and one is a procedural technique. What I will insist is, in my previous experience with teaching this course, I have found that even at the end of the course, a majority of the students continue to use ad hoc techniques. What I would really encourage you is to, the procedures that you learn here as part of this course, please try to apply the same procedures in the laboratory part of the course. When you are doing the design, when you are implementing the design, follow the same procedures. Or even when you are actually given a complex system to design, please look at what procedures. Okay, there may be some parts where you may have to take some ad hoc decisions, but as long as you are following these procedures, you are not only expected to finish your design well in time, you are also expected to get a correct design. Okay. So, try to go away from ad hoc techniques. And the same thing is true actually in almost any design step. So, even when people write software, they use very ad hoc techniques for writing software. So, this is a very general comment. Then of course, we will also give a hint about automated techniques. Of course, that is not really the intent of this course. Those of you who actually do a follow up course on this related to CAD may come across more automated techniques for doing it. But once you have procedures, it is very clear that if you follow certain procedures for doing a design, it is not very difficult to foresee how one can program these procedures. And you can use tools which does some of the steps that you perform manually. So, we will continue with the introduction part of it in the next lecture, where I will also talk about the various levels that you can write the specification, the various levels you can perform the synthesis and what are the realizations. Thanks.